Recently, I joined a conference where I heard about data observability. It's such a nice name. I had no idea what it was. But after uh, joining this presentation, I realized data observability is simply a combination of technical, business, and operational metadata. So it's again everything about metadata. Uh, data lineage, uh, knowledge graph, yeah, finally, data catalogs, business glossaries. These are use case examples. But uh, at the same time, I'd like to talk, uh, for example, uh, about metadata sources. So where, um, how we can get this information, especially this question for um, colleagues that come from companies, uh, IT providers. So what is your opinion? What is your use cases that you use metadata or your solutions? And then again, what is the metadata sources and how do you document it? Which kind of, which type of uh, metadata documentation do you use in your practice? Uh, Casey, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, again, I go back to, it's very hard to sell a metadata management project just by itself without being tied to a key business driver or initiative. And so. Usually, if you can find that, then you can kind of work backwards and say, okay, so for example, if we're dealing with supply chain, uh, if you're if the use case is, how do we know in real time what changes we need to make to our routing from our suppliers so that you know if there's bad weather, we can reroute the trucks, get the supplies to the right stores in time, something like that. Well, to do that, there's going to be a big element of discovery, right? And so you can work backwards. Well, to have good discovery, to have fast discovery, what do you need? You probably need strong metadata layer, right? So, okay, then people kind of agree that's there. So I think for, for the most part, like that approach usually works pretty well if you kind of back into it um, from, from that aspect. Now, I think the, the thing that people need to worry about or think about though is you don't want to be in the business of constantly manually updating metadata. You will lose. Your customers will lose. Um, I've had the unfortunate pleasure of seeing customers who quit their jobs because their boss said, hey, we bought a data catalog. Why don't you go catalog and tag you know, uh, 50 million tables? Nobody wants to do that job, guys. Right? Um, even data governance folks, their stewards, they want to help the business move forward. Nobody wants to tag data and annotate data that no one's ever going to use. And so I think um, a, a good lesson learned there is you need to find a way to understand what data is actually valuable in the environment, mm -hmm. right? And so there are, you know, tools and capabilities, for example, that data fabric where you can actually see what's actually being used, what's actually being requested, right? What's actually being, uh, what positive, positive usage or negative usage. And that helps prioritize, right? The metadata management, it helps prioritize the curation because if you can curate four tables, a day, but that's the four table is going to be used in 50% of all queries. I think everyone would rather do that than try and curate, you know, 50 million tables and no one's ever going to look at. But unfortunately, a lot of uh, products or a lot of businesses, they don't do that. They just say, well, here, I can catalog everything. I can generate a metadata on everything, but it's up to you to go figure it out. And that's where it ties into the disappointment customers have. Like, wow, we bought this product. We spent all this money on services. It's been 12 months and we still haven't gotten anything out of it. So that's the trap that, you know, I think I will just want to like lay it out there so that people don't fall into that pitfall again. Okay. Thank you. I, I will continue. I'd like to continue with Dr. Siu, but I also would like maybe you can add something about using artificial intelligence in a metadata management, because I think it's something uh, maybe very interesting to know how you can do it. Uh, so Dr. Siu, please share your experience. Yeah, so I was actually going to share an experience with a public health agency. I'll keep it very short and quick. 999, I'm not making this up, uh, databases for uh, that public health agency. And I think uh, Casey hit the nail on the head. I think part of it is understanding what data is valuable to you. So one uh, way of doing this that I have found very useful, other than the backward mapping that he mentioned, is actually take a look at your audit reports. Start taking a look at the last three years. It'll pull out the common threads where you're not doing well. That itself then reduces your sets of data to a subset of data. And that is the most important subsets of data 
that speak to the hundred of million reports that you have to give to say a state or federal agency in terms of compliance, privacy, security, et cetera, et cetera. I will have talked about that before too, right? So and there are various approaches by which one could actually distill some very key information where then you can start applying metadata and stuff, trying to ball the entire ocean and then get to a very, what I call strategic, but operational map, not pie in the sky. So this is where the input of the different leaders. So I've got plenty of use cases. You quick, I'll quickly pivot then to the AI. So that, that was in, indeed a use case actually of how to distill information and the chief uh, uh, person for that public health agency and talking to the governor Actually, they loved it. And so we gave them a 60 page report of here's a step by step by step, and here's the priority, right? Because now we are drilling it down to three key things that you need to do in the next three months, and here are the key data sets. So you're still within that metadata, but now you 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 you're really getting out down to a schema that speaks to everybody. So that now in terms of AI and the, you know, the other thing that um <laughs> I, I guess Casey's been around the block too, where We've all seen people actually quit. They're like, I'm not going to do this manually anymore, right? So I think with AI, you know, there are lots of, there's human center of design, there's automation, there's AI. You can train your models in such a way by taking that exact use case that I said, and then start building your training sets, right? Make sure they're always in compliance. Start cleaning and organizing it. Make sure that you're storing it in the cloud if, you know, if, if, if you are in the cloud. Start mining for the data that's that speaks to that audit report where you are not doing well, right? So there's many different pieces by which you can actually help. AI can actually help you, and I've seen people actually using it. Where people need help, it are two ways. One is it becomes very overwhelming. People don't know where do I begin. You know, this is too big. So helping them distill that down. The second thing is you can't train every single data set even within that. You know, you're still talking about thousands of tables. So what are the critical tables? Why are you doing it? It's going back to that same question. Why? Well, I'm tying it to the audit report. It shows historically, here are the three areas we're not doing well in. We have to improve our results. Now you're talking about outcomes. Now that's going to help you in your business outcome. I, those are the kinds of things that I think where AI has been used and has been used. And I'm going to stop there. I think Luke has a point to add. Yeah, well, I, I tend to... Uh, if I may, uh, we, we we worked a lot on on Jet AI and how it can improve this meta data management discipline. Uh, and LLMs can bring a lot, but not where you expect them to bring something. Uh, there's a lot of discussions around generating uh, descriptions and auto tagging and linking business terms to data sets based on LLMs. The problem you have is very, very clear is those LLMs are public models mm. and they don't work properly with your own company data and metadata. So in order to, to make it accurate, you need to pass to these LLMs a lot of your corporate context, including metadata from your company, which can be a danger from um, a privacy perspective. So the, the, the trend of the market now is to have your own LLMs within your corporate training those models with your content and your context by passing metadata um, to improve metadata management discipline and automate it. But honestly, uh, it's, it's a lot of, uh, there is no magic formula. Right. We were not convinced by any magic thing about AI for the time being. Okay, thank that's, you. That's and That's our okay. point. Ivailo, would you like to, uh, to share your opinion? Yeah, well, uh, touching upon AI and LLMs is uh, the obvious thing to do this year because it wouldn't be 2023 if we're not talking about ChatGPT. Uh, well, it even rise. Uh, well, what we what we found out uh, in all this hype uh, and the concerns how disruptive it will be is that it's actually quite complementary to everything that we'll do, and it has a a lot of uh, practical use cases that we can utilize. Uh, at Fontotext, we've been always in the business of really linking data with meaning uh, through knowledge graphs. And uh, because really knowledge graphs encapsulate semantics and can represent relationships between data that uh, enables uh, 
all of us and businesses to add layers of metadata that describe and connect the data in a meaningful way and more importantly in a highly contextual way. Uh, so that in effect enables interpretation of data beyond uh, simple or literal characters, strings and numbers and towards an understanding of what these data points really represent in the data world. And the pragmatic uh, output of that can be business intelligence, can be recommendation engines, can be semantic search. And of course, as we've uh, mentioned, obviously data integration for interoperability. And what we found uh, throughout this year with all, all of the use cases of utilization of LLMs is that actually knowledge graphs and LLMs can be quite complementary. Uh, and our claim is that is because a lot of the strengths of uh, knowledge graphs are really weaknesses of LLMs and vice versa. So we are trying to utilize uh, that potential uh, to all types of benefits that I mentioned. And the a really important thing is that LLMs and generative AI can really be useful for generating a lot of metadata that we can enrich uh, our knowledge and knowledge graphs with. So this is, yeah, what I can bring to the table from practical experience. <laughs>